my great honor to uh, open uh, the fourth uh, APOIS, Asia Pacific Ocular Imaging Society and Asia Pacific Teddy of Morgy Society joint uh, webinar. So this is, we have been running this uh, joint webinar for three times. Now it's a four time, I think, uh, if I remember correctly. So uh, the theme of the webinar is uh, uh, artificial intelligence and Im ocular imaging will transform the way we practice ophthalmology. So today uh, is a great privilege to, uh, to again, to have a two prominent speaker, one from uh, India, the, the, uh, from India, Ari Prasad, this is a leading eye institute and also uh, Dr. Zhang from China as well. So I will, I'll pass this uh, to uh, Jay and can, can, can Jay, uh, could you please just uh, say a few words on behalf of Asia Pacific Ocular Imaging Society. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I am Jay Chablani. I am at the University of Pittsburgh um, uh, uh, Medical Center. So good morning and good evening to everybody. Uh, it is really a privilege to have uh, this webinar conducted in collaboration with APTOS, which is going to be a fantastic talks by Dr. Zhang and Dr. Rani. Uh, I'm fortunate that they both are very close to me. Uh, Dr. Zhang comes from um, Beijing Eye Institute, and she is a prominent figure from China. She is going to talk about the pachydrusen and pachychoroid spectrum. In fact, she started looking into my fundus background and tried to look for pachydrusen. Uh, and Dr. Rani, he, she is a well-known figure in public health uh, in India. I have worked with her for almost 10 years. Um, uh, she is going to talk about the teleophthalmology at LV Prasad the Eye Institute, one of the premier eye institutes where I worked for eight years. Uh, she's going to talk about the pyramid. So we are really looking forward um, to their talks. Uh, just a couple of um, announcements that if you have any questions, feel free to uh, put it on the chat. As soon as we have done with two talks, we are going to take all the questions and looking forward uh, to an exciting uh, event. So we start with Dr. Rani uh, on teleophthalmology. Thank you so much. Hello, good evening. Uh, are my slides visible? Am I audible? Yes, all are good, perfect. Okay. So good evening. At the outset, I would like to thank Professor ming -He and the Asia Pacific Teleophthalmology Society for giving this opportunity to present the teleophthalmology experience of Elvi Prasad Eye Institute. And it's a pleasure to join with Jay as well. And I'm going to present you with an overview of teleophthalmology at LVPA Eye Health Pyramid, teleconsultation referral guidelines, how the corona pandemic has strengthened telemedicine systems at LVPI during and after lockdown and post lockdown, and some innovations and learnings to date. LV Prasad Eye Health Pyramid, as on March 2021, we have 206 primary AK, eye care locations called vision centers, 20 secondary centers, four urban city centers, three tertiary centers, and a center of excellence at Hyderabad. We also have nine partner centers and an overseas partner in West Africa with, in Liberia. The entire LVPA pyramid has been connected by an iSmart system of electronic health records since 2013. This is the fundamental requirement for developing a teleophthalmology system. Pre-corona, we had a strong teleophthalmology of primary eye care with our primary eye care vision centers connected to command center that is located at the tertiary center. Post-corona, the entire pyramid of LVP is actually connected through teleophthalmology. Last year in primary eye care teleophthalmology used for management of simple to advanced eye conditions ranging from conjunctivitis to eye cancers, more than 35,000 teleconsultations were conducted, 10% were managed by teleconsult advice alone, 22% were managed for medical care, and 16% were referred to secondary centers for further evaluation and surgical care. We have formulated specific referral guidelines for teleconsultation at primary level 
with an objective of improving the efficiency and avoiding unnecessary referrals. These guidelines were reinforced through periodic workshops for the vision technicians at the primary eye care centers. This reinforcement of referral guidelines was done through interactive workshops demonstrating referral indications in the form of pictures such as these. And both anterior and posterior segment indications were shared through the pictures. Diabetic retinopathy is also another important focus area. An in-house artificial intelligence tool, ScreenRat, is developed in the collaboration with Sigmoid. In that direction, simultaneous efforts are also ongoing for strengthening the vision technicians in diabetic retinopathy screening and referral guidelines and also fundus imaging. This is crucial as for an effective AI tool, we need good quality fundus pictures and as well as robust manual grading. Training methodology included interactive workshops, 210 vision technicians participated and the outcome is 60 vision technicians have already completed online diabetic retinopathy grading certification from University of Melbourne just within 12 weeks following the workshop. Specific referral guidelines of the cases that can be managed by teleconsult alone was developed for secondary eye care and similar specialty specific guidelines also has been managed uh, has been developed for all subspecialties which can be managed by teleconsultation another important measure for efficient tracking that has been introduced in our electronic medical record are is referral color coding so red means urgent referral that means a, any teleconsultation which has been tracked as red need to be referred within a day or within hours and this red color pops up in both electronic medical record at the vision center as well as the secondary center and also command center so that efficient tracking of patient can be done. Yellow means semi-urgent referral and green means all the conditions that could be just managed by teleconsultation alone. COVID pandemic was an opportunity for teleophthalmology. As the name suggests, teleophthalmology healing from a distance Many enabling environment has been created in the form of HIPAA restrictions have been removed. Specific telemedicine guidelines enabling telemedicines were introduced, recommending mandatory certification by doctors practicing telemedicine and also development of various specific uh, specialty specific guidelines. Lockdown period at the primary and secondary level at our LVP pyramid, more than 100,000 phone calls were made by our vision technicians in the remote rural villages. Again, the fundamental tool which enabled this was a strong electronic medical record database. 500 teleconsultations happened with the help of photographs taken by the rural population through vision technician and ophthalmologist WhatsApp group in the month of May. At the tertiary level, we had a sudden decline in the number of patients from an average of 1,500 patients per day to just 50 per day. We immediately launched a teleconsulting portal. Telemedicine achieved three significant objectives during that lockdown. First one was triage, where we could decide which patients need to visit the hospital on an emergency basis. And our case recorder the, that was provided to them actually acted as a measure for them to travel to our hospital easily. Management of medication and advice, and also second opinions also could be given to the new patients based on the review of images and reports. All of our faculties in the meanwhile completed mandatory certification that is necessary in telemedicine guidelines of India. LVPA teleophthalmology during COVID pandemic included all ophthalmic subspecialties, including telerehabilitation. The learnings and experiences were published by them. Recognizing the importance of teleophthalmology at a time of pandemic, we launched an app based telemedicine portal. We call it as Connect Care. With this app, now our doctors can connect with patients by clicking the button on their mobile phone. All appointments are scheduled. It's just like another virtual outpatient clinic. The patient schedules an appointment using an application, downloads their reports, and consults with their physician via both audio or video call. We also have launched another portal called Home Care Portal, wherein our vision technicians in the rural areas and optometrists in the urban areas, they actually reach both geriatric patients and patients with disabilities and do the necessary tests. This is like a hybrid mode of teleconsultation and the teleconsultation will be provided by the ophthalmologist. 
the purpose of teleconsult portal post lockdown now it is our integral part of our system across the network mainly to reduce the follow up visits what we have done is we have converted at least one physical visit following surgery as a teleconsultation visit this in turn is reducing the congestion in our waiting halls is also allowing us to maintain the social distance and we are able to in a better position to tackle the pandemic surge which is still going on and it also allowing us for the review of the reports and also the new patients provide the second opinions through the review of reports over the past 12 months we have completed 25000 teleconsultations across the lvpa network some innovations and learnings that we shared in this journey this is a picture of the day is an initiative to improve the imaging skills of our vision technicians to ensure effective primary eye care through teleophthalmology the above picture is an example that with a good picture one can diagnose and manage simple to complex problems such as eye cancer through an effective teleophthalmology system in primary eye care these images are shared every day within the whatsapp group of vision technicians to motivate other vision technicians which is a both motivating as well as learning experience for them grabi is an intelligent innovation of our innovation to, to uh, team it is a smartphone attachment that actually captures clinical quality anti segment fundus pictures and the best part is it can be used by the caregiver as well so these are the some examples of pictures that are captured through the grabi folding foraptor is another innovation which can measure the refraction by adjustment of the target by the patient which is used in our vision centers and portable perimeter through ohm device like a virtual reality augmented device at vision centers enabled effective teleconsultation for glaucoma measurement of visual acuity is very important for teleconsultation purposes in a validation study we found that peak visual acuity had similar results to standard visual acuity chart testing now we are testing this in different clinical scenario right now as a tele medicine adjuvant tool empowering tool another important telemedicine innovation is a drone slit lamp or robotic slit lamp which we developed in collaboration with bascom palmer miami which we are using in our isolation room now to test covid suspect or positive patients with eye problems to summarize lvpa teleophthalmology model is a technology integrated people centered eye care solution with glo by lvpi with global and social and scientific impact so that all may see with excellence equity and efficiency thank you very much for the opportunity thanks parmaja uh, it was really uh, very very encouraging and i think uh, you all have taken the covid uh, dealt with covid really well uh, with this i would request dr zang to uh, give her lecture and then we will uh, have discussion after her lecture sure sure thank you thank you Uh, so good evening, Mingguang Jai, uh, Dr. Rani, uh, Dr. Chung, and all. Thank you so much for providing me such an opportunity to present our work. Uh, actually, it's my great honor and pleasure to be invited. Today, I'm going to talk about the Parkinson and the Parkinson spectrum disorder, with particularly emphasis on their morphological features and the multimodality features. <laughs> So as a retina specialist, we all admit that a clinical understanding of ocular finder disease actually is accompanied with the development of finder's ocular finder's imaging. The best example is that PCV actually occupied more than 50% of wet age-related macular degeneration patients in Asia, but the name was coined by Dr. Yan Yuzi in US. I think the reason behind that is uh, ICGA, the Golden Standard uh, Diagnosis Imaging System, actually was first applied in Dr. Dr. Yan Yuzi's office. 
So more than any other imaging model, modality, OCT has greatly improved our ability, ability in clinical diagnosis and research since it is inception in the 1990s. Furthermore, the wide use of OCT boosts the OCT field from structural imaging to vascular imaging, which provides the opportunity to quantitative analysis of both the ocular structure and vasculature. The recent revolution of OCT, such as um, EDI and the swept cells OCT, has greatly contributed to the significant improvement in analysis of the morphology and the physiology of the corridor, from invisible of the outer um, uh, boundary of the corridor to, to partially, pa partially can be detected to the clearly um, visible by EDI or to uh, SSOCT. So in recent years, the concept of pachycorrhoidal disease uh, has been widely accepted since it was proposed by uh, Dr. Uh, David Varro and colleagues in uh, 2013 with the advancement of OCT. So um, PCD actually is a group of clinical entities that have a common characteristics, including a pachycorrhoidal and the dilated and hyperpermeable uh, vessels. Um, uh, actually, uh, Dr. Timo Selai and I have been invited to write a first uh, a Chinese, Chinese review uh, to summarize the concept and clinical features, as well as the underlying mechanism of PCD. I think we are the first doctor, Chinese doctor, to, to distribute the, uh, the concept of PCD in China. So the clinical features can be uh, of PCD can be described by Vanda's appearance, uh, OCT, including cross-sectional imaging and fast and imaging, as well as the ICGA. So uh, actually, uh, corridor sickness is the key point to diagnosis of PCD. In our previous work, we have uh, tried to use a different measuring methodology uh, to set up a multi-center normal subject database. Um, the the scatter, uh, scatter plot and the line uh, chart showing that the corridor sickness decreased with the aging. Um, the average uh, sickness dropped from a uh, three uh, average sickness actually from 378 micrometer at age 20 years old dropped down to 80 micrometer at 90 years old and has nothing to do with gender. We also find that about 5% of normal septic have sickened of corridor with the normal morphology and function of the corridor. Furthermore, uh, we found that the distribution of EDTS, average macular corridor sickness, is different in AMD, CSC, PCV, and ICN uh, patients. Currently, the uh, pachycorrhoidal spectrum now um, uh, encompasses seven major retinal conditions, including CSC, PPE, uh, PNV, um, PCV, as well as type 1 new vascularization, FCE, and the PPS. Uh, recently, a new entity, Pachydusen, has been identified to be associated with some of the entities that constitute the pachycorrhoidal spectrum. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Siva Prasad and I um, recently summarized the morphological and, and multimodality features and the clinical significance of Jusen and Pachydusen. And the review actually was published in early of this year. Um, as we all know, actually, uh, Jusen was described by a German doctor first in uh, 1955. So uh, in clinic, we actually can see different phenotypes of the Jusen, including the soft Jusen, Pacido uh, Jusen, and um, Paki Jusen. Um, different phenotype actually uh, represent different clinical significance. Um, in the review, we uh, actually uh, summarize the three uh, clinical questions regarding the different phenotype of um, uh, Jusen. So what about the morphological and the imaging characteristics of Jusen and Pachydusen? What's the underlying pathogenesis of Jusen and Pachydusen? And what about their clinical significance?
So in our review, we also suggested that the three types of juice are closely correlated with uh, clinical prognosis of the disease, including soft juice, uh, reticular persicular juice, and packet juice. Um, actually, we are quite familiar with soft juice, um, and soft juice has been described as the precursor of AMD. So because the time is limited, I just skip it to uh, the persicular juice. Um, Posidal juice was first described in 1990. Uh, they are uh, described as a numerous uniform uh, round yellow white punctate accumulations above RPE. So visibility could be enhanced in blue light. They are also known as a subregional juicenoid uh, deposit, simply in SDD. And they have been found to be correlated with type 2, 3, macular neovascularization and geography. They also association with pathology rather than AMD. And also SDD has been found, have been found asso to be associated with a single corrode. So Pacidio juice actually are visualized in uh, visualized under the blue light um, as uniformly around the deposits in the posterior pole. OCT B scan can show us that posterior juice are actually located internal to the RPE rather than uh, sub RPE. So that's why we call it a um, juice nile, sub original juice nile the deposits as the orange, um, orange um, um, uh, arrows show. So the Pasito juice um, was recognized only about five years ago. As the color fundus photo, uh, fundus photos show, uh, isolate, isolated a large juice near, um, actually is a corridor venous. Um, the findings had a red hue and with a featureless corridor. This picture also showing that the juice manifests uh, a euro shapes and do not have the grouping of typical uh, softer juice as shown uh, in these figures. And the subfovial um, uh, corridor sickness actually we can see is increased. So packet juice actually was coined by uh, Dr. Rick, uh, Richard Spider in 2018. Uh, so they are distinct, uh, distinct phenotype from the typical soft juice of AMD. Um, they are located at posterior pole. Being, they, are, uh, they have been found beneath the RPE and described as an isolated uh, or scattered yellow white deposits, well defined boundary, as I show. Uh, in the, uh, uh, in the previous slides. So what's the uh, morphological difference between the soft and the packet juice? This is illustrative uh, drawing comparing soft juice to packet juice. So soft juice often are brigade in the central macula. They have a poorly defined uh, ovoid outer contour. Over time, a focal uh, hyperpigmentation can be seen on the upper surface of juice. The large corridor vessels can often be filling thin. So packet juice actually can have a round oval shape. They typically have a more complex co uh, outer contour. The corridor seems featureless and has a redder hue uh, than does a single corridor. Uh, in addition, they seem featureless and have a redder hue than the single, um, uh, in addition to the red hue, there's a variation in the amount of pigmentation and the level of the RPE as I show here. But I, I don't think, I, I, I don't know if you can see clearly, there are several uh, hyperpigmentation at the RPE level. So I just wanted to show you the multimodality imaging of packet juice of one of my patients. This is a female uh, aged 55. A color finest photo showing that the yellow which scattered the deposits in both of the uh, ladies, you know, in both of the uh, finders of the lady. So hyper, um, Autofluorescent spots are detected correspondence with the findings of a color finders photo, as I show here uh, in the same eye. Always, so the infrared OCT can also, you know, show us the uh, the shape of the uh, all the morphological features of the packet juice. So the OCT B scan can tell us the, you know, the uh, thickness of the uh, corridor as the. Uh, the beast can show here that uh, under the juice all the subfovial uh, thickness of the corridor is increased. 
we can see it's maximum, it's approximately about 500 micrometer here. So actually, currently, several dozens have been named that the underlying mechanism need to be further explored. Actually, OCT is an important monitoring tool for dozens pathological analysis. Um, as we all know, OCT is also called optical uh, biopsy. So it has been shown that uh, what about the uh, underlying uh, mechanism for Dusen or Paki Dusen formation. So it has been shown that the branch membrane thickening impaired and the dysfunction of RPE are the pathological factors for basolaminal and the basolaminal deposit and the Dusen formation. In the normal eye, actually, as I show here, um, the brown membrane presented a uniform thickness and could not be detected easily, uh, even under the highest resolution of OCT because of its tight binding to RPE. So under the uh, pathological conditions, uh, brown membrane can separate it from RPE and could be visualized by OCT B scan. This patient actually have a uh, several juices uh, beneath the RPE. So this patient actually is a 35-year-old male, uh, complained of gradually visual loss and a distortion of his left eye. Uh, for one month, the visual acuity of the eye is not too bad, it's 2050. So on OCT B scan, we can clearly see the uh, branch membrane separated from uh, RPE. So in this uh, picture actually was a plot was drawn by myself. We we can see the brown membrane presenting a, a uniform thickness in the normal eye. And then we can see the uh, basolaminal deposit, basolino depo deposit, as well as the uh, soft juice information and the new uh, the consequence of the uh, basolaminal and the basolaminal deposit as well as juice can leading to the new vascularization. So, Actually, this flowchart summarizes the hypothesis, our, our hypothesis in the review uh, and the formation of the juicin. The initiator of the packy juicin actually uh, is the corridor. And um, however, the RPE and the branch membrane actually are the initiator for basolamino deposit and a basolina deposit, as well as juicin formation. So why do we study basolamino deposit, basolino deposit as of juicin? Because they are important precursors for AMD and the PCV. In one of the uh, of a study, we found that Bapaki juicin is strongly strongly correlated with um, uh, CSC and the PCV. Uh, as I show here, the thickness of a Bapaki juicin actually. Uh, in the package juice and I uh, is increased increased uh, than the other phenotype of juice and you know you can see here uh, 88 percent um, uh, around 88 percent of package juice were found in CSC patient and 70 uh, uh, 76 percent of package juice were found in PCV patients however in MD patient most of the juice phenotype are pseudo juice or uh, soft juice um, uh, the study from Korea also showed that Paki juicin is correlated with the PCV and the CSC soft juicin and the SDD actually is correlated with the AMD. So here actually is the comparison between our findings with the Korea study group. As you can see here, Paki juicin have the thicker um, Korea and you know it can be found in most of Paki juicin are found in can be found in uh, CSC and the PCV uh, patient. So. Um, Actually, in the um, uh, review article, we also uh, raised a hypothesis in that package juice actually is a crosstalk between PCV and the CSC because there is this controversial opinion in the past that if a, uh, there is a correlation between CSC and PCV because in our uh, based on the previous study, we also um, conclusion and we also made a conclusion actually uh, because um, the package juice are the precursors to both our PCV and the CSC. So we uh, hypothesis the CSC may be an early stage of PCV. So another uh, two recent studies also supported that the package juice is an indicator of uh, of a correlation 
impairment and is a feature of a co uh, chronic persistent or reserved CSC, and also Pachydusen uh, correlated with um, uh, PCV. So we summarize the clinical features and the significance of Pachydusen, Pachydusen, and soft Pachydusen in the re review as well. We uh, describe the appearance, location, size, thickness of choreo, clinical significance, as well as characteristics of multimodality imaging, um, uh, uh, the characteristics of uh, Pacido, of soft Pachydusen, Pachydusen, and uh, Pachydusen. So. Till now, actually, the pathogenesis of Pachydusen have not been fully uh, elucidated, but I believe in that the continuous uh, progress in the area in the area of pathology and molecular biology will uh, deeper our understanding of Pachydusen and it is, it is associations between CSC and the PCV. So there are several ongoing projects in our group. We are doing epigenetic and genetic works, and we also do a proteomics to try to find biomarkers for uh, PCV and CNC, and also further to elucid elucidate the association between Pachydusen and the PCV and the uh, uh, CSC. So take home messages. Actually, the interpretation of Pachydusen is related on advances on multi-modality uh, imaging. So continuous progress in the area of pathology and molecular biology is required for deeper understanding and uh, uh, the uh, underlying mechanisms of Pachydusen and its uh, association with um, uh, uh, CSC. So this is the our group. And thanks so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Julian. All right. So I I think it was uh, you are muted. I think uh, I yeah. I think this was one of the very uh, encouraging discussion throughout the both the both the talks. And I see that we have so many questions lined up. Uh, so let's start. Let's let's go back to Padmaja. And uh, Padmaja, would you like to uh, answer some of these questions? One of the question is on the role of mobile uh, vision center model or home care service with tele ophthalmology in COVID times. How has been your experience uh, working in India? Yeah. So I would like to say, Jai, that now along with our OPDs, we have something called teleconsultation OPD. It has become mm -hmm. integral part. And uh, this has actually helped us to, as I said, post lockdown, especially when we had this uh, teleconsultation virtual clinics running, we were targeting all our follow up patients in our teleconsultation. So that way it has actually reduced the congestion in our waiting halls. So this has been very important uh, uh, measure which has taken to reduce the congestion in waiting halls and also which could also made social distancing possible. In that idea only, we also launched this home care portal, especially because now because of the COVID uh, pandemic, which is ongoing and still going strong. And uh, the majority of these uh, geriatric patients and as well as the patients with the complete visual disability as well other physical disabilities, they are not able to reach the hospitals as effectively as possible. But again, only teleconsultation just by video call, audio call will not answer because they require some kind of testing with a refraction and a, a eye pressure. So what was happening is in remote areas, rural areas, the vision technicians are going with a portable um, refraction kit as well as the vision chart and they also take a, a portable tonometer and they go to the place and they check the pa uh, patient and then their reports will be uploaded on our app. Uh, we have made the complete portal as a mobile based and app based report, mm -hmm. teleconsult portal. So they are able to upload the reports and the doctor is able to see the report and then they make a video call and talk to the patient. Same thing is happening in the urban areas in the city as well. And this has been a great help to reach those patients who are in the need. Yeah, I, I think that uh, one of the one of the positive sides of COVID, which I realize is that we learn to make the best out of these technologies. And the teleophthalmology has uh, grown up so much uh, during these pandemic times. And now I think that it is going to become an integral part of our care. 
it's not going to go away and and this has taught us many lessons which we are going to follow even after the pandemic is over uh, fantastic uh, you had one more question that um, uh, padmaja how do you uh, look so what are the it infrastructures you guys build up during this course uh, of setting up the tele ophthalmology i think that was uh, one uh, from 2013 Uh, we had this electronic uh, medical record base our indigenous developed i smart uh, electronic medical record database and that investment was actually bore all the fruits during this crisis of uh, actual when we had to integrate tele ophthalmology in the across the network so before corona it was only with the primary i care we were practicing tele ophthalmology but after covid pandemic now we could use that infrastructure of electronic medical record database which was that is the most important thing that is required and the second was we also try to uh, develop this mobile based app uh, along with infrastructure with mobile based app and as well as with a facility to do both audio call and video call uh, so that facility is alone but i would say that the most important requirement is having an electronic medical record base where you can retrieve the data and where you also and it has to be seamlessly integrated like for example you have done a teleconsult visit for a follow patient it goes and gets integrated into the original case sheet so that there is no discontinuity of the care when the patient actually comes to the hospital got it i think one of the challenge which particularly here at upmc we were facing was that patients some of the patients were not able to actually you know uh get uh, used the technology which we were offering them and this was one of the limitation did you guys experience such issues back in the villages in india i would say the, there was more technologically limitation was there mainly from the doctors initially to adopt the technology it was wonderful to see even the remote rural patients they were able to take selfie of the pictures their eyes what was the problems that were happening and they could transmit through the whatsapp initially first month itself we did not had this mobile app uh, initially initially we just did consultations through whatsapp group where the vision technician was able to connect to the patients and the images were transferred in the form of either red eye or whatever those pictures and the patients adopted to the technology even in the remote villages very easily so nice. to be frank it was uh, from the doctor side there was required uh, some amount of training to go through the training how to access the tele consultation report and we had to also follow these uh, telemedicine guidelines of india that was a beautiful document that was brought out which actually told very clearly what is uh, that we can do in teleconsultation that is in the first visit what we can do what are the medications that we can prescribe what are the follow up visit what we can do so we exactly followed it and we made sure that all the faculty completed that certification and we also kept very clear guidelines for each specialty that what are the things that can be managed by teleconsultation which is a green color what are the conditions that cannot be managed by teleconsultation so that there is a very clear distinction that these are the conditions that can be managed and the other conditions which we will say that the patient we cannot manage you through the teleconsultation you have to come and visit the hospital so that guidelines have been made for every specialty including for the primary eye care fantastic Fantastic. Hi, Doctor Rani. Yeah, I have a question. So, yes. did you, you use the the internet or you use network? Yes. Because In you, yeah, yeah. Because you need to transfer a lot of data. So you use commercial available internet, or you have your own like private network for doing this. We used uh, no. We it is actually the app is a basically a platform which has been created, but the internet is our private internet only. and we kept a, 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 a the software has been kept or developed in a way that patient can upload reports up to 15 mb i see so so you use your your own private network yes. from lv prasad okay okay not only lv prasad we could actually uh, during the acute lockdown we were all working from home like jai okay. so we Great. were uh, we were actually able to access our uh, emr as well as the uh, app and we were working from home and probably uh, working from um, home again I see. Yeah, I think in Python, I think Python question is more towards the patient. So I believe Python patients were using their own data uh, for uh, discussing these details or sharing the information with the patient uh, with the doctor. 
fortunately the the internet is really cheap in india so oh, they, yeah. they everybody can afford it yeah okay <laughs> so we will, yeah we will give some break to uh, padmaja and move on to dr zhang a uh, fantastic <laughs> talk and uh, really um, the pachycoroid has almost become part of our life in everyday yeah. life so yeah. um zhenyan you have some of the questions sure. uh, one of the question is from one of our uh, ex fellows from india ashray uh, he asked that uh, do you have uh, how do you look at pachydrusen and pcv relationship and i would just add one more question from my end that how yeah. do you look at the pachydrusen in pcv and cscr oh okay actually in our previous study also you know confirmed by other studies as as i show in the slides uh, from the korea group we found that actually pachydrusen are correlated with csc and uh, pcv because more than i think more than 70% uh, patients uh, uh, with uh, SNC have a uh, Pachydrusen and PCV for more than 88% is much higher than AMD patients. So I think we need to follow up those uh, patients who have a uh, Pachydrusen without any sign of PCV or CSC to follow up them. Uh, I actually, in my clinic, I follow those patients every half year. And after two years later, one of the lady, actually I show in the slide that the, the lady have, um, you know, Pachydrusen in both of the eye, right? So one of the eye actually have um, RPED, just the, you know, the, uh, the, the location of RPED is corresponding with the Pachydrusen. So it's very interesting to follow up the patient in the future if the patient uh, developed or prog progressed to CSC or PCV. But in my clinic, actually I noticed that, um, some patient from, you know, um, from outpatient department, actually some patient developed uh, to new vascularization or um, double layer sign from CSC patient. So if you use the OCTA, you can detect the, you know, occult uh, CNV under the, you know, the beneath the retina. So I think it's very interesting to follow up those patients with Pachydrusen if the patient in the future can develop it to CSC or PCV. That is true. That's really nice. And do you, there is one more question that how yes. do you uh, look at significance of pachydrusen in wet ARMD? Do you change your management? Do you believe yeah. that these two things happen <laughs> together? Yeah, your your good question, a smart question, actually. Um, actually, in my clinic, I only have a up to 10% AMT patient have a Pachydrusen. Also, uh, one of my PhD students found that only um, few patient of AMD patient have a second uh, choroidal sickness. So most of the AMD patient actually, actually have a single uh, choroidal sickness. So I think that's why, you know, because Pachydrusen is correlated with the Pachy you know, with a um, second uh, choroidal. So I think that's the reason, one of the reasons why AMD patients have less Pachydrusen. Most of the um, uh, AMD patients have been found to have a Pacido Drusen or um, a Softer Drusen. So for AMD patients, I'm not, I'm not quite, you know, you know, to have a, you know, strong evidence. I have a, you know, uh, so those patients have a Pachydrusen. So I think it's interesting to evaluate the age because I have, a, um, in my data, in my previous study, I found a, about 10% a of AMD patients have a Pachydrusen to be found out uh, Pachydrusen. So it's very interesting to follow up those uh, patients to see what happened in the future. If they contribute to the development of um, AM, a wet AMD or um, the progression of a wet AMD. Yeah, so I noticed, yeah, I yeah. noticed that some Pachydrusen on your background, maybe we can follow up the eye to see what happened in the future. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and I, I truly believe that uh, the ethnic variation plays a very important role because uh, as you know that I changed my practice from India to here, and I see a totally a dis different disease distribution <laughs> here and the, the presentations are, are totally different. It just surprises me. So this has been totally a new learning process for me. 
So Thank what you. we published back in India, particularly for the packet rules and in CSR and PCV, we noted that the incidence was much less uh, compared to what was being reported uh, in the West. And this I am talking yeah. about uh, back in 2018, 19, when I was in India. And I think that, that the ethnic distribution definitely plays a role. So I believe that one of the larger studies comparing different ethnicity uh, sooner uh, before the, the the meaning of ethnicity gets more gray, we should be actually looking at that uh, much sooner. That, exactly. That's really nice. Actually, I just read a paper published um, last year in last year uh, from India Journal of Somology. The also, you know, also evaluated the packet tools and the association uh, between packet tools and, and the PCV. I think they have a nice pictures, and I, I think the author did an excellent work. And he supported the hypothesis that there are the correlations between packet tools and the PCV. It's very good. Yes. Yeah, it's a very good job. Yeah. Um, so how can you, so, 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 interrupt. so, but how can you prove this causal association? Because a lot of association is just association. We're not yeah. sure this is really a yeah. causal uh, relationship. Right. So it right. really require long-term follow-up data to confirm, either exactly. confirm or just right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Currently, I think we just have uh, some cross-sectional data, but I think the follow-up the cohort data is more important to confirm yeah. the associations because for the three group of patients, you know, from different countries, we have uh, found already found the quadrature and correlated with, you know, it's a combined actually is um yeah. yeah combined with um PCV and the CSC. So I think the, the stronger evidence can can be you know, provided by the cohort study. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say as well. So yeah. since the both PCV and CSC, they both have thick choroid, right? Yeah. So could the pachydusin be just coincident? Yeah. Yeah. So you, well, probably we need a long-term study, as you yeah. mentioned, to prove yeah. it. Exactly. Yeah. Also, genetic work have found that, yeah, you know, uh, some patients with the Parkinson and with the PCV as well, they carry on the uh, the same gene mutation. So it's interesting to use, um, you know, some biological or biomarkers to further to confirm the hypothesis. Yeah, but could the biomarker be the biomarker for only Parkinson for the thickened of choroid? Yeah. Because you have thick coral in like many diseases now, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, the problem is uh, we don't have uh, any pathological evidence for Pachydusin now. So most of the evidence actually come from the imaging analysis. So that's yeah. the, yeah, the big issue. Also, we don't have uh, animal models to mimic, you know, the pathological process of Pachydusin formation. So that's the, yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now the recent yeah. understanding of chronic uh, venous congestion, which is becoming more important theory for the pachychoroid, might actually answer and link most, most of the things, which we, we obviously have to learn a lot um, through the white field imaging. Yeah. All right, so do we have any other questions, any other comments? I have just one more comment for Dr. Rennie. I think uh, every person is doing so well on this teleophology, teleconsultation, in particular, the guideline you establish. So this is a good asset for any people who want to practice teleconsultation in ophthalmology. So uh, I will talk forums and try to establish a resource center at APTOS. And then we just collect all these guidelines being used by a major or leading eye hospital, like for example, every person. So then we just put it there so people can refer to it if, if they really want to do a teleconsultation in their country. So uh, I won't put a comment and we'll just put it there. This is a published paper, this is guideline or yeah. the protocol that you're using in India. That would be a, a great asset for, for, for the society, but also for a lot of doctors as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, when, when we are talking about this, I think one of the ma major concern which telemedicine is bringing up is one of the issues is the billing because so far the CMS has leased, released a little a different code for the billing and that's how we are able to charge the insurances. However, wow. it does not seem to be continuing in near future. So we, we might have to really 
fight for the 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 billing or uh, being uh, charging for the telemedicine so how are you guys are you guys charging differently padmaja yeah so what uh, there's a very important question so you know right uh, in lv prasad we have both paying patients and uh, non paying patients so right from the day one what we have decided is the patient has to enter their mr number unique mr number so which has the p and n n means non paying so as soon as they enter n and their actual mr number so that immediate verification happens and they will not be need not pay any consultation and uh, the whereas a paying patient we are charging 250 rupees indian rupees uh, for the teleconsultation advice uh, and uh, again uh, it will be valid for 12 days up to their visit to the hospital so but otherwise if they cannot pay they have to use their mr number but of course for the follow up patients uh, it is their mr number is what we are taking as a criteria okay and one more important concern which i really think is going to come up in near times is that you know how confident you are in making the right diagnosis and giving the right suggestion and and you might really get sued because uh, you right. missed diagnose something or you missed something yeah. urgent yeah. so what kind of protection do we have when you are actually treating your patients through telemedicine i think so this, is, is where, this is where uh, the telemedicine guidelines of india has given very clear instructions we have our telemedicine report has to be exactly like the clinical case sheet so the opd is almost we have to consider it as a just like our virtual patient opd clinic so the document has a consent initially the the patient unless it clicks it will not go to the next uh, uh, next format and uh, the case sheet we uh, in, including the prescription everything has to be in the similar format as the clinical case sheet so nowhere it can be uh, different from our clinical case sheet documentation and we are also taking the help of uh, our secondary centers and uh, our vision centers and some of the patients who are coming from the uh, far off locations we are asking them that to go to their local doctors and then upload the reports and seeing the reports and advice on the whole opinion then only we are able to give the advice right but do you guys are taking any formal consent before you really have a telemedicine consent kind yes. of that whether it has its own limitations and we agree to that absolutely even not only the uh, there is a consent even the teleconsultation uh, uh, report the case summary that goes to the patient also has a disclaimer in the down that it is the advice has been provided by the teleconsultation as per the information that is provided by the patient right i'm just bringing out these important issues because you know as we are moving forward and uh, we are moving more towards the telemedicine part i think it is very essential that we take care of uh, these things it's In very fact, yeah. uh, the medicines that can be prescribed also like uh, telemedicine guidelines of india said that only antibiotics can be prescribed on the first visit whereas steroids and all cannot be prescribed so what we have done is for, we have made our own guidelines as i said how we have made indications guideline similarly we said that these are the prescription like for example a patient like management of medication was one of the most important uh, uh, advice for which during lockdown the patients actually approached us like for example glaucoma patients uh, retina patients any patients they wanted how they want to continue their medication so if it is a follow up patient is there and that is where the electronic medical record was a big boon so we know what the drugs the patient was taking so we were able to give the similar prescription Uh, based on what is that necessary you can continue the medication depending on whatever the available information paisan you had some yeah time? yeah dr rani how you handle the um, data security and data privacy yeah so the data security and data privacy so what we have done is the report uh, that patient gets will be gone to his mobile uh, phone and uh, and on the sms unless he enters his mobile number uh, mr number he cannot access the report so the once i finish my teleconsultation i provide the advice that form will go as a, a message to the patient mobile phone and he has to enter his mobile number to access that report so it will go to the registered mobile number of the patient so how do you handle all the images 
the images are hand uh, uploaded by the patient i yeah. won't be sending any images i only will send the report so the images should be stored in some kind of server yeah right so that is what we have did that infrastructure of mobile app where the patient has a, a limit of with a, uh, a facility we can we uh, we kept a server limit of they can mm -hmm. upload up to 15 mb their photographs and their octs their fundus images up to 15 mb size they can upload the reports and that is mainly for the new patients but for follow up patients we can actually access our uh, emr we call it as emr light so we can actually access the entire uh, patient visits and the report as soon as i enter the uh, click the uh, mr number and do you i mean do you handle the server by yourself yeah have we process server yeah. right yes it's yes. not like well, no. third party server no no we didn't go for third party server we actually developed our own server and uh, we have developed our own team uh, for this activity because uh, the whole electronic medical record is an indigenous our own team so that is also one of the important aspect why we didn't wanted the data especially to yeah. go into yeah. the third party server yeah okay great thank you wow, dr right. rani you are doing such a impressive work i mean in one year seeing 35000 people have a very uh, i mean well developed protocol and a team of people i mean congratulations this is a great work we again again we are very keen to collect your i mean your in, more information about your guideline or even we can run a case study and try to understand how you run this uh, so successfully in every person thank very you very fantastic work. excellent yeah. very very nice discussion thank you so much thanks everyone uh, for fantastic talks and the participation this has been a wonderful morning for me and uh, evening for you all uh, with this uh, if we do not have any comments we will just call it a day Uh, thank you so much, and have a great evening and great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all. you so much. See you next month. Thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you. Guys. See you next time. Thank you. Bye, Bye all. Thank you, Dr. Lenny.